Well, good morning. Great to see you all. Here, here we are. I, I have a best friend. This is very, very classic of a person to say because my best friend is my dog. And I never thought I would be one of those kinds of people, but she just kind of gets me. She really understands me. We're a good fit for one another. Now, she's an Australian shepherd. Her name is Maya. And this was us playing broomball a couple weeks ago. And yes, she will play any sport with me, which is part of the reason why I love her so much. Uh, we are just like a perfect fit. She's high energy. She's up for anything. She's super nice. I think she's what they call like a uh, high energy submissive. Like she's like, she'll, she just wants to be a part of the pack and help out. She wants to have a lot of fun, but she's also, she realizes she's not the one in charge, which is really nice uh, for being able to train her. So this is Maya. I have one other picture of Maya. This is her playing with her best friend who lives just a couple houses down. Yes, it is also an Australian shepherd that looks identical to her. So a lot of fun getting to tell the two of them apart. So we have this great dog. She herds our kids. She herds the chickens. She herds other dogs. This is just kind of built into who she is as an Australian shepherd. Um, but her life wasn't always so rosy and so nice. We got her when she was nine months old. She started out her life uh, with a different family uh, who honestly, I think, just wasn't ready uh, to step into having an Australian shepherd. They just basically had this little puppy that had all this energy, and they were like, yeah, we can't handle this. We need somebody to help. So they had her kenneled up a lot of the day. Um, and so our friend, who's actually a fellow Meadowbrooker, called us up. This was prior to our time at Meadowbrook, my wife and I. Um, she said, hey, you know, we're trying to find a family who would like to take an Australian shepherd, a nine-month-old Australian shepherd. And so we said, okay, bring her over. I mean, we have kids, we have chickens, we have cats. I don't know how this dog's going to fit into our life, but sure, bring her on over. That sounds good. Uh, so she came over one day. And she got to run around in our fenced-in backyard, and she just absolutely loved it. As you could probably imagine, this dog who has all this energy, finally, her cage grew a little bit, right? It went from about this big to about a quarter of an acre. And so she has had this area to run around, and she was great with the kids. And so everything changed for her. It's like she woke up in the morning, and she thought it was just going to be a normal day. And by the time nighttime came around, she was living in a new home, she was also marking her territory in the new home, but that's a different story for a different day. She had this radically different life. It wasn't uh, just like a new life for us. I mean, we woke up, I woke up that morning loving animals. I mean, I just love dogs, but I thought, yeah, it's just too much. We can't do it right now. But by the time nighttime came, of course, I met her and I fell in love with her and I was like, all right, we can have a dog. It's fine. So it was this drastic change that happened in both of our lives. And for her, it happened because somebody saw what her condition was and did something about it and intervened and reached in to do something about it, to, to pull her out of this place of being in captivity in a life where even her owner said, yeah, this is not good for her. And somebody reached in and actually did something about it and brought her into a different reality. This reality of being in one place, of being confined, and then being brought out of that place into a new place is just one of the images that's used throughout Scripture to speak about sin. It's to speak about what happens when we live a life that is out of step with the way that God has created it to be. So in a couple of weeks, we're going to get into that, I think, because Romans chapter 7 is all about that. If you know the book of Romans at all, Romans 7 talks uh, about Paul's struggle with sin, about this struggle that he goes of his old life and now his new life, which is in Christ. But Paul's also using this Exodus narrative. If you remember the story of Exodus, it's the second book of the Bible. Uh, it's a story about how the Israelites had spent 400 years in the land of Egypt. They were in captivity. And then God called Moses, a very broken man with a checkered past to come and lead God's people out of the hands of the Pharaoh. And this theme, though it doesn't come up explicitly all the time in the Bible, it's an undercurrent to a lot of the Bible. So as we read Romans chapter 6 and chapter 7 and chapter 8, probably the three most famous chapters in the book of Romans, as we journey through those chapters coming up, 
Keep that in the back of your mind that Paul actually has this image of the Exodus as he writes it. Romans chapter 6, we're going to see that we are like the Israelites, that we're being led out of Egypt. Paul is going to use this language about being baptized into Jesus' death. That he went through death, just like the Israelites had to go through the Red Sea. They went through the Red Sea. God made a way where it didn't look like there'd be a way. They walked through the sea and all of their oppressors were left in the sea and they came out the other side. Romans chapter 6 is going to be about that. Romans chapter 7 is what happens when you're in the desert. What happens when you're in the desert of sin? He uses that to lead into Romans chapter 8, which will see us entering into this promised land of life by the Spirit, or life in the Spirit, and what a difference that makes. So we've been working through the book of Romans over the past several months. If it feels like it's taking a while, it is. And it's going to keep going for a little while, and that's probably a good thing, because this book is so detailed. In fact, it was a letter. I think most of you probably know. It was a letter written to a church, which Paul probably did not have personal contact with. He never went there and actually met these people. So it's written a little bit differently. It's not like a personal letter in, some of, in the sense of some of his other letters uh, where he's talking much more personally to people about their faith, but he sets it up in this kind of a diatribe style. And what that is, is essentially it's what you would have used in an ancient court of law. You're, you're bringing up a question, and then you're drawing a conclusion, and you're answering the question, which then leads to another question. So there's this kind of call and response that you read, and there's different voices that Paul is even speaking from in, uh, in, throughout the book of Romans. So that's what we see. In, in Romans chapters 1 through 3, it pretty much is Paul laying the table, saying, listen, whether you consider yourself a, a part of the people of God or you're not a part of the people of God, the, the reality is, is that we are all sinners, that we all fall short, right? It culminates in chapter 3 where he, ta- he makes us look at ourselves and say, yeah, I'm a part of the problem. And then chapter 3 is where Paul makes a turn and says, therefore, God's grace is for everyone. It's not for just a specific group. It's not for just insiders, but it's actually for everyone. And so that's what Romans 1 through 3 is all about. And then Romans chapter 4 is saying that Because God's grace is for all people, all people can experience it through faith. That people who experience God's grace are people who experience it through their faith in Jesus. And and the first person that showed us how to do that was Abraham. Abraham was this faith person. that there There wasn't a law from God when he first started following God, but that God called him, formed a relationship with him, and he believed God. And Paul says it was credited to him as righteousness. And then last week, last week we talked about being dead to sin, but alive in Christ. And Craig used these two images. He he talked about the image that that Paul used of Adam, of being in sin, in the world, being disconnected from God, and then the image of being in Christ. So that is what Paul has been talking about. But so we stand at this place in Romans, at the end of chapter 5, And we probably have been thinking, like, okay, some of us are on board with that. We're tracking with that. We believe in Jesus or we've decided that we're going to say yes to Jesus. But now the question is, like, so now what? So so now what what do I do? I've been saved. I've been brought into this new reality. Or, like, I'm kind of like the Israelites. I've been taken out of captivity in Egypt and brought through the Red Sea. But now I'm standing in this desert. And, like, what am I supposed to do? And uh, in particular, uh, we've asked this question. Paul's asked this question at the end of chapter 5. This question about God's grace in your life. Because if you you came to the end of last week, there's a question that you should have. Because here's what Paul said. He said, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So we find ourselves in this like freedom It's kind of like my dog being brought into this new environment, this loving environment where she has more space, more freedom. We're kind of like, oh, no matter how much I sin, God will just keep loving me, right? And maybe you've experienced that even with your dog or with with a kid, right, that you're trying to raise and teach them how to be. It's like, my parents will love me no matter what I do. And so this question comes up like, 
can I just do whatever I want? And that's what Paul is going to tackle here in Romans 6, verses 1 through 7. So let, let's read it together. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. So this is a passage that's packed with a lot of images. There's a lot of images happening. I want to challenge us this morning because the images are actually there to shape your identity. Who you are. The images are strange. We're going to talk about the strange images that are here in this passage. Uh, If you've been in church and heard this passage before, it's easy just to let it wash over you and be like, yep, heard that before. But we're going to think about what Paul actually says in this passage. Because here's what Paul, I think, is at the core of what he's saying. If we were to wrap it all up into one statement, we would say that what's true about Jesus is true about me. What's true about Jesus is true about me. Now, don't take it to the extreme, right? We know that we are not Jesus in and of ourselves, but Paul wants us to go pretty far, farther than sometimes we're comfortable with. He wants us to see that we are united to Christ, that what happened to Jesus is actually the reality for us. This is, this is something that we, when we say yes, when we say yes, I want to be a part of this, that we actually get wrapped up into it. So it's one thing to ask this question that Paul asks at the end of chapter 5, this question of shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase in the abstract, like it's an abstract question, like can I just do whatever I want? But if we look at it through the eyes of the fact that what's true about Jesus is true about us, we'll see it different. Because if we don't see it like that, we'll be tempted to see it in a different way. Uh, One way we could see it is like a math equation, right? Like we can just keep on adding more and more of the stuff that we like to do apart from God in my normal everyday life and God's grace will just keep on going. So more sin equals more grace. So then more sin equals more grace. And it's a sort of a math equation. And the amazing thing about what Paul says in chapter 5 is that there's an element of that that's absolutely true. That God's grace is unconditional and there is no end to it, his love for us. But that, that's actually true. But to see our life with God in this way is missing something absolutely vital about the nature of God. And it's this. It's the relationship. What is he calling me into? So yeah, he took me out of Egypt. I was in slavery. But what is he calling me into? The desert? The desert in a relationship. It's the relationship that he's calling us into. He's actually calling us into something new that changes everything. You know, one of the amazing things about, I started thinking about this. There's so many things in our world. I mean, just, you could take every little thing you interact with from uh, the people that you're around, also to the things that you interact with, like your car or like the places that you go. And if you start asking this question about the relationship you have to the things, it it really starts to clarify things for me. Um, For example, I don't know who built these pews. So I have no emotional connection to these pews whatsoever. They they seem like nice pews. But but if you were to ask me, like, what, what do you think about the pews? Like, what if they were in a different spot or like different questions like that? Well, the relationship really defines how I feel about them. I'm like, 
I don't know. There's probably people with a relationship with them who have a stronger opinion about this kind of thing because the relationship changes everything. When I think about in my own life, several years ago, we started asking the question, my wife and I, you know, like, what are the things in our life that we don't have a good relationship to that we would like to get better, that we would like to build a relationship with? And one of the things that really became really clear to me quickly was that the food that I eat, and now this is just for me a personal thing, right? I thought, I'm going through this ritual of eating food three times a day or more, and yet I have almost no relationship to where any of it came from, right? And so I started thinking about that in my own life. We started taking small steps, right? We started growing a few plants the first year and then more plants the next year. We started growing a lot of vegetables, and now we have a huge garden bed that we've done. We, you know, it, it turned into composting everything, all the organic matter that we have. We composted now because we thought we want to have a relationship at least to the food that we eat and the soil that we have. And we're not perfect, uh, but that's one area where that's why we have chickens. We said we want to have some sort of a relationship. That's why we started meeting the person who we buy our meat from. is because we wanted to add a relationship to this part of our life. We started to take small steps because we realized that there is no relationship, that where there is no relationship, there is no real motivation to change. There's no real motivation. There's, you don't have any skin in the game if there's no relationship. It's kind of like how I feel about a lot of things in my life. If you walk past a person on the street and you have no relationship with them, you don't really think too much about them. But if you walk past a person on the street and you see that they're having a hard time and you know them, you might do something about it. You might take a step to change. And I think that's a part of the core of what Paul's getting at here in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. He's pointing out that if there's no relationship with God, if it's simply a math equation, like I can keep sinning and God will just keep loving me and it's a transactional relationship, if it's just that, then we miss out on who God actually is. That God in and of himself is in relationship through the Trinity with himself, but also with his people. It's really amazing. What, what so often gets obscured in some of our minds, think about it. When we think about salvation and God, and God saving us out of our sin, out of the grasp of Pharaoh and into a new life, is the fact that God is calling us into something new. Do you recognize, do you remember that God is not just saving you, but he's calling you into something new. He's calling you into this relationship. So think back on the Exodus story. If you remember the Exodus story, Yahweh, uh, Israel's God, he leads the Israelites out of Egypt and into what? Into a desert. Now, I mean, not that I need to critique God on this account. If I was God, I would try to lead them immediately into a very posh lifestyle so that they knew just how much I loved them. But God doesn't do that. He leads them out of Egypt, which they were in slavery, and nobody wanted to be in slavery, but he led them into a desert without food and water. Hundreds of thousands of people wandering through the desert with no food and water. So what, what's better, being in captivity? And you hear this, right? Being in captivity or being in the desert. You hear them saying this throughout many of the first couple books of the Bible is that they're wandering in the desert and they're like, I can't believe you took us out of the desert. I wish we could go back to Egypt. That we, At least we had food in Egypt. And you hear them complaining, right? The grumbling that comes up again and again and again in this story. God saved them. But the people really weren't that happy about it. I mean, they were happy at first. But as time went on, they were not happy about this. And so why? Why is it that God did this? Why is it that God led them to a place like this? where they had to wake up each morning and go out and look and see if manna was there, if food was going to be there, where they would have to keep going and they would have to rely on God to give them water. Why would he do this? Because he wanted them to see that he was with them. He was in a fire of smoke and a, a, a pillar of smoke 
and a pillar of fire by night. He showed them his presence. His presence was actually with him. It was better to be in the relationship with God in the desert than to be comfortable in Egypt where all of their needs were met. See, if we're dealing with God like a math equation, then yes, more sin equals more of God's grace. But that dynamic makes a mockery of this relationship that God actually wants. There's another good story about this in Matthew chapter 18. Let's think about a different one. Jesus tells this parable about this king who has a servant who owes him 10,000 talents, which is essentially a lot of money. And in the story, the king represents God towards people like us. People who have this massive debt. I mean, so many of us, before we met Jesus, we were just carrying around all of the burdens of our past. And so often, even after we've met Jesus, we still carry around so many of the burdens. And so Jesus tells this parable about this servant who owes this master this huge sum of money that he'll never be able to pay back. He'll never be able to get rid of it. And we don't need somebody to, like, take care of a little bit of it. We need somebody who's going to come in and take care of the whole thing. And what happens in the story? The master forgives the servant everything. He completely changed. It's like Maya coming into our new home. It's like everything changed in in the blink of an eye. And and in Jesus' parable in Matthew 18, the servant does that, or the master does that for the servant. And so the question that's baked into that parable is, so now we being forgiven everything, how do we act? How do we act? Now that we're in relationship to this one who has forgiven us, how does that change the way that I act, right? And that changes Romans chapter 6 verse 1 completely. Well, what should I say then? Do I keep on sinning? Not if you're in relationship to somebody who has totally redeemed you, totally changed everything about your life. In the parable, the servant doesn't get it. He goes back to somebody who owes him just a little bit of money. You remember what he does? He takes him to court and he says, pay it back. And Jesus' response cuts straight to the core. He says, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? So go back now. Go back to Romans 6. Verse 1, read that question again. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? As long as we're untransformed by the gospel, you probably will. You probably will. And so, so a lot of our life is actually getting ourselves to a place where we're reminded about what's actually true about us, about what's true about the good news of Jesus. And that's what Paul continues to write about here today. So the first thing that's true about you is that, this is going to sound weird, your baptism, and and let's just say you're saying yes to Jesus. You are inviting him in. You are saying, I want you to be a part of my life. Your baptism, your saying yes, is a funeral ceremony. It's a funeral ceremony. Nobody ever told me about this, about my baptism. I I waited uh, several years. I was really a Christian my whole life growing up. Uh, I didn't get baptized until I was 18 years old because I wanted to really own it and I wanted to make sure I understood what it is that I'm doing. But nobody ever told me that my baptism was in a way a funeral ceremony because Paul says it. He says, you are baptized into Christ's death. This is Romans 6 verse 3. He says, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. And my response, I don't know about your response, my response is no. I actually had no idea that's what was happening. I, people told me it was uh, an outward expression of an inward grace, which is totally true. Like God came and did something in me, and now I want the whole world to know about it. 100% true. But there's this deeper thing that's going on beneath it. When, when we come to Jesus, that our baptism, he says, don't you know you're, when you were baptized, You were baptized into Christ's death. Go back to that Exodus image. It's like you went through the sea. You went out of your old life. You went into your new life. And your old life is totally washed over. It's gone. Never to be seen again. Isn't that amazing? This is what it is when we say yes 
to Jesus that in our baptism, we are going through like what Israel went through. We are going through like what Jesus went through. That's what happens. Remember back in Romans 5, Paul uses this image of being in Adam. He, he puts these two people in front of us, Adam and Christ, or being in Christ. So how do we then move from being in Adam to being in Christ? I'm going to skip ahead just for a moment to, to verse 7, the end of our passage. Paul says, anyone who has died has been freed from sin. This is another thing we don't think about very often. Sin, we kind of assume we know what it means. It's, it's basically just doing things on our own terms, not really caring what God might have to say or how he built us as humans. Sin is a precursor to death. Death is the thing that we're all on some level afraid of and that we're all moving towards. We don't like to think about it that often, but all of us really are. And sin is like a precursor. It reminds us that that's where we're heading. Every time we sin, I think, oh yeah, I'm kind of heading towards there. I don't like to think about it, but this is actually what's true. But Paul puts it this way. He says, anyone who's died has been freed from sin. Because think, once you've died, sin is kind of pointless, isn't it? Because sin was leading you towards death. But if, if you could die, if you could somehow die, but then keep living. You, you could be done with sin. Now just think about that. It takes a second. You got it? If you could somehow die and then keep living, you could be free from sin. And, and even if you still struggled with it, which next chapter we'll get to that, <laughs> even if you still struggled with it, you could repeatedly remind yourself that that's not who you are. Every time you looked back to Egypt again and said, oh, remember, oh, they had so much good food there. <laughs> God will give you like three feet deep of food. I don't know if you remember that story. It's in Numbers. But, but you'd be reminded that like, oh yeah, even what I think I want so often leads me to a place I don't want to go. It leads me to death. That's what sin is. You get roped around by it. And Paul's saying, is there some way we could get out of this cycle of sin and death? He says, yeah, anyone who's died could be freed from sin. So didn't you know that you were baptized into Jesus' death? No. Well, now you know. You've been baptized into Jesus' death. Think about it. It makes total sense in relation to Jesus' call in Matthew chapter 16. He says, if anyone would come after me, they must take up their cross daily and follow me. This is actually the core of what it is to follow Jesus. It's, it's, you're recognizing I am going to a funeral ceremony where I willingly let myself die with Jesus so that something else removed from the sin that so easily tears us down could live. Something that could be free. A free humanity. That's what Jesus, right? He came, Jesus came to set us free. This is what Paul is leading us into. It's really amazing. But you might have a question like, okay, that's cool, but what am I dying to? What am I dying to? A lot of things. It's probably going to be personal to each one of us, but in general, what I would say is you are dying to your own definition of right and wrong, to you calling the shots in your own life. So think all the way back, and we'll go this way, all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 in the garden. What did they take of? They took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's another way of saying humans started defining for themselves how they would live apart from God. They're not going to listen to God anymore. They're going to define for themselves what it is that they're going to do in their own life. So they took and they ate of this fruit where they defined for themselves how they were going to live. And this is at the root of everything, right? It's a pride. It's essentially putting yourself up as God. That's what's at the root of it, of all sin, is, is you, you wake up and you say, I'm going to do things my own way today. And that's at the root of everything that we do apart from God. And so the oldest Christian tradition, some of the oldest Christians 
equated something. It's really a beautiful, beautiful image. Is that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in Genesis, they would say, actually, the cross was made out of the same wood. It's an image. It's an image to say the place where sin entered the world is now the place where sin has been taken care of and done away with once and for all. Once and for all. You look back at your own life, the places in your life where sin just gets you down, where it's repeated, where you struggle so much and you wish you could be freed from it. When Jesus sets you free and, and you believe him and you take steps and, and even on like just once, just one day to say, yes, God, I'm finally following you. You find that there's this power of God that comes into your life. You're able to stand, to have a clarity of mind and a clarity of life. Can you look back at those areas in your life and see how God has been redeeming you? Has it has been making something new? The areas in your life where you looked and you said, this is my weakest moment. This is my weakest area of life that God actually wants to use it as a place of resurrection in your life. This is the good news. This is the, the beautiful part about being baptized into his death, about being dying with Jesus is that we get to be raised and God's going to bring something new and beautiful out of our lives. But Paul doesn't stop there. He keeps going. He, he answers this question. He says of the question of why do we have to die with him? In verse four, he says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the father, we too may have a new life. And the whole point here is that the dying part to kill off the things that if you, is that if you don't allow God to change, they will ultimately kill you. The dying part is to kill off the things that if you don't allow God to change them, they'll ultimately kill you. So let's breathe for a moment. We might be thinking, Paul, this is so much stuff about dying. <laughs> Why are you talking about this? Uh, let's talk about something more positive. God, won't you just love me just the way that I am? I have so many people. I've had that thought too. God, just deal with me, God, <laughs> just the way that I am. And, and the beautiful reality that P Paul got done talking about in chapter five is actually God does love you just the way you are. God does love me just the way I am. Even, even when I think I know best, God loves me even in that broken place. But he loves me enough not to leave me there. He's not going to leave me there. He's not going to leave you there. He actually wants to change you. That, that's what this following Jesus thing, it's a, it's a transformation. It's not a self-transformation. It's not, not something you can do. You actually have to do the opposite. You have to, you have to surrender. You have to die. So that Jesus can live in and through you, which means you're gonna have to learn to trust. It's like being an Israelite, walking out in the desert again and being like, I, I know God gave us manna today, but I'm really worried about the manna tomorrow. <laughs> That's gonna be a daily routine for us that we're gonna have to wake up again and go, like, yeah, I did a great job trusting yesterday, but this is another day, another day. To follow Jesus. And when we learn to trust him, to say, give me this day, give us this day, your daily bread, our daily bread, that is when we rise with Jesus. So our baptism, our saying yes to Jesus, our accepting him into our hearts is in many ways, as weird as it sounds, as weird as it seems, it's a funeral service. I'm burying this old life in the ground so that I can rise to something new, which is what Paul points to next. Here's verses five through seven. He says, if we've been united with him in his death, we'll certainly be with, united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been free to sin, free from sin. In other words, you're alive with him. What's true about him is true about you. Not only did you die with him, you're alive with him. You now have a reason to live. You have uh, Jesus, the one who created everything, living in you. Just stop and think about that for a moment. He's here. 
He's living with you and anything is possible. This putting to death of the old opens up this relationship to the new. And amazingly, we get to live it. I mean, you, you get to live it. You get to go out today. You get to leave this place and live a life where God is with you. It's unbelievable. You know, as I was thinking through this, um, I was trying to think, you know, gosh, how, how do we show what this looks like? Like, is there a person who has lived and exemplified this in a way uh, where it would be compelling, where it would like draw our attention and be like, oh, what if you could be like that? And so for a lot of the characters in the New Testament, the way that I, I love the stories, but then I always, maybe some of you have this thought too. I always have the thought of like, so what, what happened after that though? <laughs> because Jesus would heal a person or would change a person's life and then you don't get to hear anything. And I'm like, well, yeah, but like, what about a year later or three years later or 10 years? Like, how did this person's life go? And one of the ones that uh, is just so fascinating to me is the character of Lazarus, right? Lazarus was one of Jesus's friends who died, was in a, a grave for four days that he was starting to stink. So he was really dead. And Jesus came and resurrected him. And brought him back to life. And, and there's this play by Eugene O'Neill. It's about a hundred-year-old play. And it's not very well known. It's called Lazarus Laughed. Maybe a few of you might have heard of it before. But, so it's not scripture. It's just an imagination. It's, it's imagining what must Lazarus' life have been like after he came back from the dead, which is just like a great question. <laughs> it's a great thing to think about. So here's, here's a, a few things from Lazarus Laughed. And just allow this to kind of um, bring your imagination forward and imagine what would, they, like, if you actually died and came back and Jesus did that, what would your life look like? It says, as the curtain goes up, Lazarus is seen stumbling out of the dark, blinking into the sunlight. And after the grave clothes are taken off of him, Lazarus begins to laugh, a gentle, soft laugh. Uh, the very first thing Lazarus does is to embrace Jesus with, with gratitude. And then Lazarus begins to embrace his sisters, Martha and Mary, and the other people who are gathered around him in astonishment. And he has a very clear look in his eye. Nothing, nothing far away. It's as if he's seen the world about him for the very first time. He reaches over and he pats the earth very affectionately. He looks up at the sky and at the trees, at the neighbors, as if he's never seen them before as if he is overwhelmed by the, all the incredible rightness of everything that's around him. The very first words that Lazarus utters are the words, yes, 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 as if to embrace reality as, as it's being discovered all over again. So in the play, he makes his way back up to the house. The whole village of Bethany is awash in wonder. Finally, somebody gets the courage to ask Lazarus. They say, so what was it like to be dead? What, what's death like? And Lazarus answers them. He begins to laugh even more intensely when the question comes up. And then he says, there is no death for those who are in Christ. There is only life. There is only God. There is only incredible joy. Death is not the way it appears from this side. Death is not an abyss into which we go into chaos. Death is a portal through which we move into everlasting growth and everlasting life. And with that, Lazarus's laughter began to fill the whole house in which he was staying. And then he got back to his daily tasks. But there's something different. He was calm and not anxious anymore. He's no longer vulnerable to that fear that diminishes the vitality of life. And the house where he lived began to be called the house of laughter. And night after night, you would hear singing and dancing. And the spirit of this one who had come back with this message that there's nothing to fear began to spread throughout that whole little village. And the quality of work in the village it began to rise up all over Bethany. People began to live in harmony and more generously with one another. The conflicts of old died down and joy settled over this whole little community because someone had come back saying that there was nothing to fear. This is some intense language that Paul uses this morning about you're buried with Christ, you died with him, and you rise with him. But it's supposed to change you. 
It's supposed to change you into the person who knows what's next. Right? That's that question. And what's next is that what's true of Jesus is true of you. That you have already walked in to eternal life. Did you know you're already, for those who follow Jesus, you're already, you've already entered into it in the here and now. And death will be a portal of more growth, of more beauty, and more love. So the invitation this morning is for you. It's, it's the fact that even in the midst of a passage like this that's filled with a lot of imagery and a lot of intense language, there's actually life. It's an invitation to live a different life, to see the world with the eyes of Jesus, and to transform the areas where we live. Would you pray with me? God, you invite us into something that's hard to imagine. And we thank you for, um, we thank you for scripture. We thank you for the book of Romans. We thank you for Paul, who was faithful in, um, to write it, led by the Spirit. And, and God, we look at it and we, we really want to move into it. We want to embrace it. And so I just pray for everybody who's here um, today. We, we all come from different places, but wherever we're at, Lord, I pray that you'd meet us. I pray, pray that you would give us a next step coming out of this, that even in our hearts right now, we might be convicted in the ways that, those old ways of areas of sin where we know we just want to put them aside. We want to take a step towards you again. God, I pray for people in this room who really just haven't seen the good news of Jesus for what it is. This invitation to a life eternal that starts right now. And so, God, I just pray um, that people would be taking steps towards you this morning. You move in our hearts. And God, um, lastly, we just thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what you did in and through Jesus, for who he is. We thank you that he lives in our hearts now. I pray that you would really put that awareness on our hearts as we move from this place. In Jesus' name, amen.